The Night Watchman, or A Wailing Story. This play examines the moral hazards of command and the perils of souls, by E. Tomlin. This is a play in five acts, which is structured around the inquiry into the sinking of Captain Pollard's second ship, The Two Brothers, that occurred in the Pacific. This allows for the development of the facts relating to the sinking of his first ship, the Essex, to emerge, as well as the events leading up to it. Pollard at the, is at the time a young man in years, but old in tragedy, a hero in somewhat the same way that Oedipus of Thebes is, not so much for what he does, but for what he endures. The staging of the play should be toward a minimalist set, allowing the audience's imagination freest reign. The cast, although large, could be reduced by using one actor to play several parts. Act 1, Scene 3. First mate, Eben Gardner, and Captain Fuller aboard the two brothers. Captain, Captain! What is it, Mr. Gardner? She is blowing too hard for the sail we have out. Why, right. Shall I take down the top gallant yard, sir? Aye, Mr. Gardner. I do not like the looks of those angry black clouds coming at us. No, sir. No, sir. The wind had changed direction on us and veered around to the west. I'm going to change course to the northeast to put the archipelago we have been following between us and the storm. What do you say of that plan, Mr. Gardner? I like it as well as any other. What did you say, Mr. Gardner? I said that I liked it as well as any other, sir. I think that is a very good plan, sir. Do you feel all right, sir? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. And, Mr. Gardner, see to it that the boats are secured and if the wind keeps rising, close reef the fore and mainsails and furl the mizzen and topsails. Aye, 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 sir. The other side of these islands is a reefy place. So tell the boat watch to keep a sharp eye out. Aye, sir, I shall take care of it. Right away, sir. Can I think you use those words deliberately to torment me? To set off a charge of power in my brain? I must not allow myself to think that. It is a common form of speech, appropriate to the circumstance. It meant nothing. Owen? Owen? No. No, I, I, I must forget about it. Put it behind me. This ship will not suffer such a fate. There it is again. Owen, what did you say? Owen! Your hair is on fire. Or is it merely the reflection of my own head? We shall escape at this time, Owen. You'll see. We will. Why do you nod your head and turn away, Owen? Come back. Act 2, Scene 3. The sun is low, but not yet set. Captain Pollard is leaving the wharves, having spent the day supervising the provisioning of his ship. A young man approaches him. Cousin? Who is it? It's me. Owen Guffin? Yes. What is it, Owen? Is the Essex about ready? Almost. Have you filled all her berths yet? I have filled most of them. But not at all? No. Not yet. Cousin. What is it? Have you taken my friend Charles Ramsdale? Yes. Would you take me? Take you? Yes. Seventeen now. What does your mother say? My father would approve. Yes, but I know and I'm still wearing the black arm bag for him. Aye. And he was less than a whaling cruise. But we talked about it. He hoped I would follow him. What does my aunt say, Owen? Uh, it will be all right with her if I can go with you. I know it will be all right. You're keen and you have to be good to be a ship's master at your age. Besides, she won't have to worry about feeding me for three years. You went to see the other than I, and you've seen something of the world. You made something of yourself while I'm rotted at home, looking out for my mother. But the bitter truth is that my mother doesn't need me to look out for her. Please, cousin, take me with you. I want you to make something myself too, before it is too late. If you won't take me, I'll sign on with somebody else. But I'm determined to go. Oh, and if you get your mother's permission, but only then. Thank you, George. One thing, Owen. What's that? Until we set foot back in Nantucket, 
there will be no more cousin or George, only captain. And whatever I say, you are lookout, helmsman, horseman, cutter. Is that clear to you? Yes, captain, it is. And thank you, Captain Bullard. Board ship, your job is to do what I say. I will learn what you want and do it before you can say it. Good. Then you will do well. Thank you, Captain. Good night, Owen. You're still my cousin until my aunt says that you can sign the papers. Good night, cousin. Act 2, Scene 4. The wards, a short time later. Charles Ramsdale arrives. What did he say? He said I can go. Did he? And you were worried. He said I can go with my mother won't get permission. She wouldn't have required that if you weren't family. I don't know if my mother will get it. Come on. We have to talk to her. Explain things to her. You know her? I... I don't think she'll get it. She, she won't get it. I know it. Don't give up so easily. We can talk to her. It won't do any good. I have talked to her before. So have you. But you didn't have actual possibilities before. That's different. It won't be to her. You can have your cousin talk to her. He will defer to the wishes of his aunt. He will not pre present a strong case for her if he senses she opposes it. I have another idea. The pastor might talk to her. He always likes to see Islanders working hard, earning money, and making contributions to his church. Do you think you could convince her? The widows trust him. If she thinks we have arranged it to convince her, she will not agree. I'll suggest it to her. But you must oppose the idea. You suggest that she talk to the captain. I will. Your idea is worth trying. There's nothing else to work. I believe I have a distant cousin of yours aboard my vessel. Really? Are you related to the Nantucket Coffins? Assuredly. Then you must be related to this young man. What is your name, lad? It is Owen Coffin, sir. My father was Hezekiah. Indeed. I have heard of him. Was he not killed by savages off Timor? Aye, sir, he was. He was a distant cousin. It is always a pleasure to come across a relative in the world. Sir, we also are related. My aunt is this boy's mother. You are related to him? Aye, and through him to you. Act 3, Scene 7. Captain Pollard, First Mate Owen Chase, and Owen Coffin are standing together on the deck of the Essex in the late afternoon of November 16th. The first mate still looks somewhat bedraggled, his boat having been thrown into the water earlier. I saw it happen to you. There was nothing to be done about it. We could not have prevented it. Her harpoons were at the ready, but she simply came up under us and with one blow of her tail smashed the bottom. You don't look the worse for your back. <sighs> oh, my clothes are still wet. You should have been in the captain's boat. It would be drier. It has happened to me. Were you afraid? No, Mr. Coffin, for I could see the ship coming towards us. The snap and rustle of her sails, her broad beam lumbering in our direction and a pitching perambulation across the waves, and having the sure and certain feeling that she had kept an eye upon us would, ere long, rescue us from our troubles. I could anticipate her raising me up to her deck and enfolding me again in her bosom. Aboard her, we are safe from all those things hidden beneath the surface of the sea which might attack us, devour us, or harm us in some other way for no reason known to us. I have quite the warm feeling about the Essex, Mr. Coffin. Some men condemn her for all the pains we would have put into this voyage. But I, sir, say she has saved us from worse, and she had nothing to do with those difficulties that we have had, for they are simply attendant upon our going forth into the wider world. Had we not had this good ship, we might have perished or been stranded like the Archimedes crew. So, sir, treat her well, I say, and she will continue to do the same to us. Aye, Mr. Chase, you are quite right. Listen with all your soul, Owen, for what the first mate says, for he sees the Essex as she truly is for us. Now, turn to the task of stoking the fire under the, the, the tripods and put her to work cooking the oil that will one day put food on our plates and then tuck it. Act 3, Scene 8. The Essex, November 17, 1820. Owen Coffin and Charles Ramsdale are talking. He won't give me a chance at it. He will. Just be patient. No, I don't think he will. I have been patient. What can you do about it? I don't know. He has promised you next time. I just 
want to throw that harpoon once. Next time. He said he would give you a chance next time. You said it before, then he doesn't do it. Then he doesn't want to lose the fish. Or the conditions aren't right, or it's something else. Do you think maybe he's looking out for you? Why? Because of your mother? I don't want his protection. Mr. Chase went from harpooner to first mate on his next voyage. Then when I get back, how can I tell anyone that I can throw a harpoon if he doesn't give me a chance at it? You will get your chance! No! I don't think so. We still have a long voyage ahead. There is only one way to change matters. What is that? Switching boats! Switching boats? Leave the captain's boat? To the mates or Mr. Joyce. Have you talked to him about that? Not yet. What do you think? I think it would be a mistake. Why? You would offend him. He has offended me by treating me like a child. He might not agree with it. He might not agree to it and might be hardened against you. That is true. Better wait. Besides, I would miss you. Act 3, scene 9. The Essex, the next day, Brasilia Ray, Owen Coffin, Charles Ramsdale are talking. Another day and none have been spied. They will. What's your hurry? He hopes the captain will let him throw the harpoon. Oh, you want to be a harpooner, eh? <laughs> Tired of just pulling on the oars like the rest of us? That's right. What makes you think you deserve to throw the iron? Because you're related to the captain? Is that it? No, because... Because I believe I can do it. Oh, he believes he can do it. First voyage, and he believes he can do it. He's never done it, but he believes he can do it. Stop spearing him. <laughs> what should I? You two are always swimming together. If one spouts, the other does. Have we caused you any trouble, Mr. Ray? No, I want to be sure you don't. By rights, I should be the next man on the captain's boat and have a chance at it. I'm older, ain't afraid of the whale, won't wet my pants or throw up. But I'm not related to the captain like some others on this ship. Is that it? Owen's not afraid of the whale. Of course he ain't, or he wouldn't be on his boat. But I say harpooning is too important to be trusted to a tadpole. Gotta have a clear eye and a steady arm. Like you? Yeah, like me. And what about aim? That's the most important thing. To be able to put the point of the iron where you want, deep in the whale at the right spot. Then you got it. No matter how far he runs, nor how fast. You get it in him, and he can't get it out, can't get away, he's yours. Everyone goes home a little sooner, that's what's needed. Good aim. Well then, maybe we ought to see if your aim is truer than Owen's. To decide who gets first chance. Yeah, how are we going to do that? We'll set up this barrel, put an X on it, and the closest to the X wins. Fine by me. I've seen you practicing, but I don't mind. Natural to me. I don't need practice. If you know how to do it, you can do it. What's the wager? If the captain gives me my first chance at it, I give it to you, or the other way around. Yeah. And you get to brag over it. Tell me better I will. Charles, put the barrel a ways off. Far enough? There. Mr. Ray, you can go first. This will show you who's suited to be a harpooner. Huh. Must have been a little off that time, but I'm not worried. Go ahead, Mr. Coffin. My turn? Hmm. How did I do? Owen is closer, Mr. Ray. Come here and look if you don't believe me. That don't mean nothing. We didn't shake hands on the bed, so it's off. Doesn't count. You can't do that, Mr. Ray. Why not? Your friend gonna tell the captain on me? I'm going below. It was a dumb contest, means nothing. You two ganged up on me. My pa said a man that don't keep his word ain't much of a... What? Nothing. Good. He sure is mad. You showed him. Your harpoon hit the mark in his pride. <laughs> <laughs> what can Kenny do? Hit me with his tail? <laughs> Act 4, Scene 1. The deck of the Essex in the evening of November 19, 1820. The crew is sitting about and Brasilia Ray is playing a harmonica and the crew is singing. The captain stands at the edge of the group, 
behind the witness chair with his hands upon the back of it, his words directed at times to the audience and at times to the crew. Those disagreements were to be expected on a long voyage. There were nothing to worry about. The crew was on the whole harmonious. Come all you young fellows that's bound after sperm. Come all you young fellows that's rounded the horn. Our captain has told us and we hope it was true. There's plenty of sperm whales off the coast of Peru. Captain was right! We have weathered the horn and have now left Peru. We are all of one mind and endeavor to do. Our boats are all rigged and our masthead is manned. Our rigging is road light and our signals all planned. In the morning, so early at the break of the day, the man at the masthead will cry, Yonder she spouts! Where away does she lay? And the answer from aloft! Two points are lee bow and three miles off. Then it's call up the hands and it's be of good cheer. Put your tubs in your boats, boys, have your bow lines all clear. Sway up in your boats now, jump in your boats, crew. Lower away now, lower away. My brave fellows, do! That, to the best of my recollection, that's how it was on the evening before the first disaster struck us. Which we at the time naively believe must be the worst. I see it not only as the approximate cause of the horrors that follow. We were by then an experienced crew, officers and men, having been at sea 15 months, and having completed over half of our anticipated voyage. We had left the South American hunting grounds and were looking for whales in the Pacific. On November 20th, the year the boats lowered to take what we could of a shoal of Sperma City whales. The first mate's board was damaged when the creature into whom we, he had thrown his harpoon tossed itself at Mr. Chase's boat and gave the boat a blow with his stale flukes. Mr. Chase immediately cut himself loose from the whale and using oar and sail made it back to the ship where he repaired, repaired the boat. But while working on it, he saw another whale. hundred yards off the weather bob that suddenly spotted and disappeared, reappearing a ship length off and making directly for the ship at a speed of three knots, the ship going at a light velocity in the opposite direction. Steer her, hard up! But it was too late, and the whale struck the ship and threw all aboard to their hands and knees. The whale had damaged the bow, and the ship began to settle in the water while the whale, after apparently convulsing from the blow, came toward her again, traveling at twice his former speed, and struck her a second time, completely stoving in her bows. Cease pumping! Provide for yourselves! We, in the meantime, continued to pursue the hunt, oblivious to the dangers the ship was in, until a member of my boat, Obed Hendricks, stood up. Captain! Where's the ship? At that moment, I turned around and swept the horizon, but could not see a ship or a sail anywhere. I cut us loose from the whale and signaled the other boat to do the same, and we made haste in the direction where the ship had been. When we finally came upon it, I saw the first mate disconsolately seated in his boat, two ships length from the wreck, and the Essex on her side, slowly sinking. My God, Mr. Chase! What had happened here? We have been struck by a whale. Further elaborated upon this, as I have told you. We then were twenty men in three light open boats on the immensity of the Pacific Ocean, more than a thousand miles from the nearest land, watching that which represented some point of security, sinking before our very eyes, buoyed up temporarily only by the barrels of whale oil that we had been in such pain to secure. Before she broke up and sank, we managed to salvage two quadrants, two compasses, two sets of charts, and as much hard bread and fresh water as we dared to load in our boats. Along with that, some extra nails, hammers, and wood to try to build up the sides of our boats, so that they might survive at least moderate seas, and for us to be able to make modest repairs. No 
also rescued some firearms, two pistols and a musket, but at the latter with the men on the other, but, but I'm getting ahead of my story. We were moored to the wreck for two days, salvaging what we could until I called, I called out, Bush off! We were determined to stay close together, and the next day, the mate called over. Captain, we have crossed the equator and are in the southern latitudes again. The day after the seas began to rise, at night, we came into the boat. Captain, the salt water damaged our provisions. Then we will eat the damaged portions first. Otherwise it will spoil and reduce our chance, the chances of our survival. That decision was the means of our preservation. For without the whole of our rations, every man of us would have perished. Nevertheless, thirst that the salt water damage bread created in us, which we dared not satisfy with our limited supply of water, can better be imagined than described. We held seawater and even our own urine in our mouth in desperate hopes of reducing us, that thirst. But all to no avail. We were in our boat for 30 days, alternately despairing and filled with hope of rescue. We were on our course by favorable winds and buffeted by unfavorable ones, attacked by the elements and even creatures of the deep. These incursions were of such a serious nature that both my boat and my first mate's boat required makeshift great fear was that we should lose any of our boats and have the, to have the occupants of that boat, the remaining boats, thus overloading them, reducing the rations in them available for each man, and seriously reducing what small chance we had of surviving. December 20th, a month after we were wrecked and set adrift, a man in the third boat cried out, There is land! It was, we believed, Lucy's Islands in the South Pacific. 24 west, 40 minutes south latitude, and 124 west, 40 minutes west longitude. It was formed a coral, all in shape, and a mile or so in length with vegetation on it. And we did not know if it might be inhabited by hostile savages. Act 4, Scene 4. Captain Pollard, in his weakened condition, struggles to come aboard the third boat, accompanied by another member of the captain's boat, Obed Hendricks. Gentlemen, we face adversity, even desperate circumstances. We are still men of discipline, restraint, obedience. We are God-fearing men and men of the sea. Each man follows his orders, performs his duty as well as he can. I have come aboard to perform the funeral service for Mr. Joy, and I have brought Mr. Hendricks from my boat to take charge of his boat, of this boat, so that no man need feel that I have abandoned him and withdrawn my benevolent authority and influence from him. Mr. Hendricks will carry out my orders, and when I'm not available, he will commend you in conformity with how he believes I would in those circumstances, or according to his own best judgment, if it is not clear to him from previous experience and his knowledge of me, what I would be like to do. Is that understood? Aye, 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 Captain. Mr. Hendricks. Aye, sir. Well, Mr. Shorter, have you fixed the ballast rock to the body of Mr. Joy? Aye, sir. I have done it. Then, I must begin the service for Mr. Joy. I will recite the 23rd Psalm and request all of you to join me. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I, I shall not want. He, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Unto Almighty God, we command the soul of our second mate, Matthew Joy, pass from this life on January 10th, 1821, and we commit his body to the deep, the sure and certain hope of the resurrection into eternal life to our Lord Jesus Christ. 
who's coming in glorious majesty to judge, to judge the world, the sea shall give up her dead. We may gently lift the body of our mate and place it in the water. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The Lord gives and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Act 4, Scene 10. The Captain's Boat, February 6, 1821. Captain Pollard, Owen Coffin, Brasilia Ray, and Charles Ramsdale in a wretched state. Captain, how long can we continue with nothing to eat? I have not the strength to set the sail. If we ship water in a storm, or from a small leak, none of us has the strength left to bail up from the boat. <clears throat> it is true that we are in desperate condition. But what is there to do about it? We can hope for a sail. We have hope and praise, Charles, for 78 days. I believe God has set his face against us. What else is there to do? <coughs> I heard stories, Captain, passed down from sailor to sailor. Captain, the means to give some a chance. Say what you are thinking, Mr. Ray. It's not my place, Captain. Damn you, Mr. Ray. <clears throat> if you know something that can help us, out with it, sir. I order you to speak. Very, very well, then, sir. Shipwrecked men who are near to death from starvation have been known to cast lots to decide which of them are to survive <clears throat> and which are to be sacrificed for the others. I have heard of that, Mr. Ray, but I might reach that point. Ask your crew, Captain. Uh, Mr. Coffin. I. Mr. Ramsdale. I. Mr. Ray. I. How shall it be done? Shall I tear four strips from the log book and pinch one of them short? Who draws the short one agrees to sacrifice himself for the rest? Is it agreed? I. Who shall do it, Captain? Draws his pistol out from the, the sea chest and place it in, places it on the seat. Those remaining shall draw again. Is that also agreed? I. I, I was convinced that Brasilia Ray would draw the short length since he had been the one to put forth such a hellish and unspeakable idea that had the power to draw desperate men to it as flies to a dung heap. I did not consider that since I was in charge. The punishment might fall upon me, though I was prepared to die. Yet, the Lord his infinite wisdom made the punishment worse than I had ever at that moment imagined. Here, gentlemen, who will choose first? I will. Oh my God. Owen, oh, it is you. George, am I to die? Oh, and if you do not like your lot, I will shoot the first man that touches you. I like it as well as any other. Act 4, Scene 12. The offices of the ship owning company and the captain's boat on February 6, 1821, now presented simultaneously. We must draw for who does it, Captain. I will prepare them. Though the time I pray that I would not draw the short one myself, yet now I think that if I had the immediacy of having to perform that act would have dissuaded me from such a devilish nostril consequence for our ultimate survival or my authority. But having once embraced the plan, my neediness, my weakness, and an unforgiven destiny determined that I should be spared nothing, not one drop of the bitter drink, I have them. Here. Is it the short one? It's the one you drew. My God. Must I shoot my best friend? You have no choice. We agreed. I will not hold it against you, Charles. George, if you return, tell my mother how I died. Captain, must I do it now? If it must be done, then let us all get over with. Goodbye, George, Brasilia, Charles. He puts his head on the gunwale, and Charles Ramsdale fires with the pistol. 
Act 5, Scene 4. Captain George Pollard and the heathen gardener aboard the two brothers. The squalls have become a gale, sir. Indeed, sir. Have you been able to take any sighting to plot a position? I have tried, Captain, but I cannot vouch for them. If we do not stay in the channel, we shall wreck on a reef uh, or the shoals. I did my best, sir. Have you posted the extra watch? I have, sir. With the driving rain and the approach of darkness, I do not know how much good it will do. It must do some good, sir. I hope so, Mr. Gardner. I hope so. Breakers ahead. Bow hard of weather, helmsman hard, sir! Act 5, Scene 5. Captain Pollard, Captain Worth, Mr. Ransom, in the company's offices. We have a report from your first mate, Captain, which I will read to you. The ship struck a reef of rocks. She appeared to float once her length, and then struck again so heavy as shattered her whole stern. The sea made a road over us, and in a few moments the ship was full of water. Is that what happened, sir? Took to the boats and fought against a storm through the night. The next day we were rescued by the Martha and lost no hands. Yes, Captain, but you lost your ship. I did, sir, I did. But not one member of my crew. Are you not expected to bring your ship and your crew back safely, sir? That was impossible. So you say. So it was. How many barrels of oil is aboard her? Eight or nine hundred. And of course you lost it all. Yes. It adds to the loss of the ship, Captain. You see, Captain, your men may be willing to sail under you again, but they cannot offer you a ship. He is an able mariner, Mr. Ransom. Perhaps, Captain Worth. But the facts are he has sailed out master of two vessels and has come back with neither. He made no obvious errors in seamanship. Still, he has lost two ships. To what shall we ascribe it? To you and Captain Pollard, whaling may be a contest with the sea as well as a profession. But to me, sir, and to the owners, it is a business. Risks, sir, must be modest, must be calculable. So many losses and so many voyages, it is necessary that we be able to determine the risk of losses so that we can establish charges that allow us to make a small profit. Now I ask you, sir, having lost two ships, how would you rate the chances of Captain Pollard preserving his next one? You may say that there is nothing that connects them, but the fact is, he connects them. Though the formal laws of mathematics may encompass the possibility of the soul-trying misfortunes of this man, still, the very sensible improbabilities of his story point to something beyond them. I, for one, would not wish to test it again. Well. <clears throat> I am sorry for speaking out of turn. I was speaking for myself alone. I will have a written record of this inquiry prepared for all the owners, and they shall render a decision on the captain's conduct of his vessels. Thank you, gentlemen. Act 5, Scene 6. Captain George Pollard and Mary Pollard in their living room. Well, it was not unexpected. What did the owners decide? Nothing. They made no determination. That they did not blame you, then? Nor did they clear me. What does it mean? No order will sign me on again as master. They should have found for you. It makes no difference, Mary. They say me as if it... It is not fair. I myself do not wish to go to sea again. Still, it is not kind. This is a small thing. For me, some time ago, the gentleman of the mercy of the universe was torn from its side. I find only an exciting scar when I go over. Act 5, Scene 7. A woman stands by the railing on the window's walk above her house looking out to sea. She moves along to the adjoining railing. They leave us as innocent boys and come back to us as men that we cannot understand. Haunted by spectral ghosts we do not know. The end.